Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, welcome to the lecture tonight where we're going to go on a journey. I'm going to take you on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. We're going to start with the mouth and we're going to end up at the other end. Your gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube and anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you and me. And last night when we looked at the liver, we had a look at what happens when it gets absorbed into the blood. We actually followed the journey of how it gets into the cell. But tonight we're going to have a look at the amazing process that transforms the food that's on your plate to microscopic little substances that can, then gets absorbed into the blood. So this hollow tube, anything that in, is in it is not part of you or me until it gets into the blood because the Bible says that the blood is the life of the flesh. Now in Australia we have a lot of sheep and they're born with tails and what the farmer does is he puts a little rubber ring around that tail, the, you know, the base of the tail and eventually the tail falls off. Why does the tail fall off? Because that little ring has stopped the blood. <laughs> so that's why the blood's called the life of the flesh. The, the flesh is only alive because it's been bathed with blood. And in our next lecture, where we look at the immune system, we'll be looking in a little bit more detail at the blood. What an amazing thing it is. But let's begin by taking you on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. So notice that the, the main hole in is the mouth. And here it is up here. The mouth is the first organ and most people don't realize that digestion begins in the mouth and the pH in the mouth is alkaline. So what are the enzymes that are released in the mouth? One enzyme is tylen. And tylen is called a salivary amylase because tylen breaks down starch. Or you could call that carbohydrate. So what is starch? Starch is anything like bread, pasta, cereal, uh, uh, bread, pasta, cereal, cakes, biscuits, things like that. Potatoes, they're all your starch. So tylen is the salivary amylase that begins the breakdown of starch. There is no tylen in the mouth of a baby. And the first teeth that a baby gets are four at the top and four at the bottom. And those teeth are called milk teeth. They're called milk teeth because that's the main food that babies should have. But it's also taste time. This is a good time for baby to suck on a piece of apple, suck on a gum away, maybe have little bits out of a celery stick or a stick of cucumber. And I remember we were eating at my daughter's place in Tasmania. It was the middle of winter and it was very cold. And she had a fire in the lounge room, so we put a sheet on the lounge room floor and we ate our meal there. And her little 10-month-old baby, what did that baby want to do? That baby wanted to do what we were doing. And yet the baby's only got four teeth. And so my daughter said, what will I do, mum? I said, give the baby one of those steamed green beans. And that little baby sat there so happy thinking that it's doing everything that we're doing. And it took half an hour for that baby to get through one centimetre of that steamed green bean and little bits are all over the place. Do you know, that's taste time. But baby's main food should be milk. The next teeth that come through are the molars. The molars come through further along and the molars are grinders. And what do we grind? We grind grain. And when the molars are fully through, then the glands in the mouth release the salivary amylase tylen. So a baby should not have any starch till the molars are through. What age is that? That can be anywhere between 14 and 20, 22 months of age. And what are mothers told to give their babies at four to six months of age? Cereal. What's cereal? Starch. Did you know that that's where um, malabsorption syndrome can begin to be built up in the gut is way back then. Do you know babies were not fed starch? They weren't fed any types of food a hundred years ago. 
200 years ago. Now, I'll tell you a story to illustrate. I had a lady email me. She said, Barbara, my little baby, he's just not thriving. How old is he? He's 10 months old. What does he eat? Bread, pasta, cereal, vegetables. How many teeth does he have? Four. What's his stomach like? Bloated. But he's skinny, so she's feeding him more. Is he breastfed? Yes. So I explained to her, and I have a lecture on um, YouTube, it's called What Shall I Feed My Baby, which explains this. So she said, what will I give him? I said, just give him fruits and vegetables, but keep back the starches. She mommy back, oh, his tummy's got right down. He's actually starting to put on weight. See, the poor child, he just wasn't, di wasn't able to process or metabolize that food. So everything was good. When the baby's 14 months old, she emails me. She said, Barbara, the baby stopped eating. He won't eat a single thing. I began to investigate. Remember, we, are all, we should all be private investigators. Is he teething? Yes, the molars are coming through. I said, oh, it's not uncommon that a baby go off the food when they're teething. They're not themselves. Is he breastfeeding? Yes. Don't worry about it. She emailed me a week later. What if he gets brain damage? I thought, where's this coming from? Brain damage? What if his muscles start to deteriorate? I said, did you know that God made breast food perfect? You know what the amazing thing about breast milk? It's perfectly designed for the baby when it's two days old. Perfectly designed from when the baby's six months old, 80 months old. My last baby, I fed him till he was three. She said, you know, it may not be enough. I said, it is enough. A, a few days later, I get an email from her father. I'm a scientist at Loma Linda University. I believe that my baby, my grandson, is going to be brain damaged because the baby's only on breast milk. We would like the baby to go to hospital and be tested. What are they going to do? Take blood? What's that going to do for the baby? And my wife say... Um, physiotherapist and she believes that the muscles are deteriorating. Uh -huh. See, he was very, very premy, this baby. So he was smaller than usual for his age and he'd actually stopped crawling. I said, he's teething, he'll be all right. And then I said to the father scientist, I said, did you know that 100, 200 years ago, babies were not fed food till they were two? Do you know what that means? Galileo, Einstein, Bach, Handel. Ah, they were not fed food as babies. Did they suffer? And I said, what are they going to do to the baby in hospital? What if the baby gets so upset with all this blood being taken that it actually stops breastfeeding? So they backed off. Two weeks later, the mother emailed me, the teeth are through, the baby's feeding, eating more food. He started to crawl a bit more. I got an email from the, father, from the grandfather, this girl's father. He said, thank you so much. Can I give you something? I said, oh, if you want, here's my bank details, $400 in the bank. <laughs> that man was very, very grateful. Because I, I said, what are they going to do in hospital? Put an IG tube down the throat? Uh, force feed the baby? What's they going to Can you see how you have to take it to its end result? These things will pass. Of course, when they're sick, they're not the same. This is a very important subject because so many people have gut problems today because they were fed starch too young as babies. The other enzyme that's in the mouth, you have sublingual glands under your tongue and they release lingual lipase. And lingual lipase is an enzyme that breaks down short and medium chain fatty acids. So the tylen breaks down the starch and saturated fat, which is your medium and short chain fatty acids, are broken down in the mouth. Now, the most amazing and beneficial saturated fat is the coconut. So coconut is unique. The breakdown begins in the mouth. It's an amazing oil. Now, let's move on down to the esophagus. 
the food starts to come down here. By the way, before we move on, there are exposed bone in your mouth. What are they called? Teeth. And they have a purpose, and that is to break up the food into very tiny particles. Did everyone hear that? Very tiny particles. I was at a restaurant one day, and the lady just across me, I think there were two, two chews swallow. Two chews swallow. I thought, whoa, her poor stomach. <laughs> the poor organs down there. They don't know what's coming down there. There are no teeth in the stomach. Hmm? What's the old saying? We should chew our drinks and we should drink our food. What does that mean? We should be chewing up our food until it's almost liquid. It's a good idea to put the knife and the fork down between mouthfuls and look at the view. If you've got a nice view outside your dining room window, we're such a fast society today, we usually just eat too fast. I think it's such an enjoyable time of the day, why do we rush it? Some people say, well, I rush it because when I was a kid, my brother, if I didn't hurry up and eat, he'd, he'd eat my food. <laughs> yes, those sorts of things may start to happen. So it's important to chew, chew, chew. Why? Because there are no teeth in the stomach. And when you chew, you break the food down to tiny particles, which means there's a greater surface area for the enzymes to work on. And also, when you chew, you are mixing the food with saliva, and, and in the saliva are these enzymes, so the breakdown can begin to happen. There's something else. When you're chewing, messages are going to the brain. And the brain says, ah, oh, there's a bit of starch in there. Ah, oh, there's a bit of fat in there. Ah, oh, there's a bit of protein in there. And then it sends messages down to the pancreas, down to the stomach saying, yep, yep, there's a bit of protein coming. Yeah, there's a bit. Can you see what's happening here? And the other organs are getting ready. But three chews swallow, three chews swallow. These organs are saying, what's coming? And the brain says, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, we, we don't, it's not in there. <laughs> Can you see there are several reasons why we need to chew, 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 chew. Coming down the esophagus, there's a gateway in the stomach. It's in a double, double layered gateway and it's called the cardiac sphincter. And the cardiac sphincter opens when the muscles tighten to let the food through. And then as we get into the stomach, we get another stage of digestion. So the stomach is an alkaline, no, acid environment. In fact, that's the only part of the body that is acid. It's the only part of the body that should be acid. And tomorrow night, we're gonna be looking at the acid-alkaline balance in the body. So the only part of our body that should be acid is the stomach. And if someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, fantastic. It should be. But how do you know it's acid? Well, it hurts. Well, it shouldn't hurt. You see, we've got a thick mucosa law lining on that stomach. So you shouldn't feel your acid. I can't feel my acid. Someone else said, well, it keeps coming up. Well, that's not the acid. The acid's not the problem. And by the way, if it keeps coming up, it can burn holes in the esophagus and the person can get an ulcerated esophagus. Can you see now it's not the acid? The problem's not the acid. The problem is that gait. So why isn't that strong? Well, there are many people today who are eating breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and the tea is the king and the queen together because they're so busy. And so when they lay down or sit down in their easy chair to watch the television and fall asleep and then they go to bed, there's this huge amount of food in the stomach. And when the sun goes down, our body knows it goes down. And when the sun goes down, the whole body slows down. When the sun goes down, digestion doesn't happen as effect effectively and efficiently as it does at lunchtime and as it does at, at breakfast. You've heard of circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythm is set in our body by light and dark signals. When the sun goes down, there's a whole lot of messages going into the brain. So 
We don't digest as well as an evening as we do at breakfast and lunch. So having a big meal and it start, gravity causes it to push against those little valves there and it weakens it. And that cardiac sphincter, it's called the cardiac sphincter because of its relationship, its nearness to the heart. It's a muscle like this. And when it tenses, it opens. And when it's relaxed, it's closed. Now the mineral that is a muscle relaxant is magnesium. So everyone that comes to Misty Mountain Health Retreat that's got reflux or heartburn it's called, because we serve breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and tea like a pauper, and we give them magnesium supplements three times a day and just before bed, they go home without the heartburn. Easy fixed. I had one guy come and he'd been on Nexium or the equivalent for 15 years. Is it working? 15 years? And by the way, you know what they're finding now? Long-term antacids is causing or contributing to colon cancer because the protein's not getting broken down because there's not enough acid to break it down. And so partially digested protein goes all the way down here. Extra bacteria has to be created to try and deal with the partially digested protein and that can contribute to damaging the wall of the colon. Whew. I have never met anyone with an over acid stomach. It actually doesn't happen. By the way, dogs, they've got about six times higher acid content in their stomach than humans. Do they get reflux? Do they get stomach ulcers? No. <laughs> they need that extra acid because they're meat eaters and they need a lot of acid to break that down and get it through that body quickly. So let's have a look at the stomach. Let's have a look at how it works. So what is the food that breaks down in the stomach? The food that breaks down in the stomach is protein. That's actually the only food that's broken down in the stomach because starch digestion begins under the action of tylen, but it's put on hold in the acid stomach. The lining of the stomach has big folds like this. And those folds are lined with gastric glands. And two thirds of those gastric glands is mucus, releasing mucus. There's your thick mucosa wall to protect the lining of the stomach against the acid. Now these glands down here, they release hydrochloric acid. And if you were to put one drop of hydrochloric acid on your skin, it would burn a hole in your skin. You see why God made it so that there's a thick mucosa wall? Now something else that's released from those glands is pepsinogen. Pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid unite, but only in a very acid environment. And they, when they unite, they release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. Can you see why the pepsin's not released here? It'll start eat up your stomach wall. So the hydrochloric acid released, the pepsinogens released, they unite to produce pepsin, and it's pepsin that breaks down the protein. Pepsin will only work, or only be activated, I should say, in a very acid environment. So if someone's drinking with their meals, they water down the enzymes in the stomach, and the stomach knows that, so digestion stops, all the fluid has to be got rid of, and then it has to go back to digesting the food. And isn't that a nausea habit, drinking with the meals? Every time Michael and I go to a restaurant, the first question we're asked is what? What are you gonna have to drink? And we always say, uh, no, we've, we've already drank. Oh, well, we'll just bring you water. Now we let them, because otherwise they'll never leave us alone. <laughs> We're such a fast society. People are busy, 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 busy no, no time to drink, sit down to eat. Oh, haven't drunk. Is that right? <laughs> we, should be, we should stop drinking half an hour before the meal 
and that means that we've got a nice acid environment, and then resume drinking one and a half hours to two hours after the meal. If you sit to eat your meal well hydrated, you will not need to drink with your meals. In fact, at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, we don't serve water with the meals. And I have people say, I keep reaching for the water. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's the habit. That's what we're gonna look at on Saturday morning, rewiring that, and you can rewire your brain. But I'd like to speak a little bit <clears throat> about hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid isn't just to unite with pepsinogen to produce pepsin. Hydrochloric acid is antifungal, it's antibacterial. So that if any bacteria happens to be on the food coming into the stomach, it'll wipe it out. So that's why it's very important to have nice, strong hydrochloric acid. Another thing that can exhaust hydrochloric acid is constant eating. You see, digestion, approximately, there's been lots of research to prove this, it takes three to four hours to digest a meal. And then your stomach loves a one hour rest. That means we should be leaving about a five hour break between a meal. And the only way you can do this is to have a high fiber diet. We looked at this last night. To have generous amounts of protein. And to have your healthy fats. What are your healthy fats? Fats as they come from the hand of the creator. So there's your nuts and your seeds, your avocado, avocado your coconuts, and the two oils extracted from the flesh of the plant which have been eaten for centuries is your coconut and your olive oil. So it depends where you live, I guess, what oil you grow up on. We live in Australia, so take your pick. Personally, I like the taste of olive oil a little better. These are the three foods that keep the food in the stomach longer. Fiber, because it slowly releases the glucose. Protein, because it's in the stomach that protein is broken down. And fats, because it coats the food so it takes a little bit longer for the enzymes to get in there. And that allows us not to faint between meals because we're, we're getting the nutrients. And by the way, even when the stomach's empty, as you'll see a little bit later on, the food's getting absorbed down here. So even when the stomach's empty, we're not gonna die of starvation, you know. <laughs> we're, we're still getting those nutrients going through. Many people who feel hungry two hours after a meal, it's often thirst because your body doesn't know the difference between thirst and hunger. So it's only two meals, two hours since a meal and you're feeling hungry, have a drink of water. I remember one day my son Peter, he was 15 at the time, he says, mum, the water's not doing it anymore. Because I say drink. And I looked at the clock and I said, great, it's lunchtime. And that's what you find. When the water's not satisfying you anymore, it probably really is hunger. I know as a mother, I didn't want to be in the kitchen all day long. I love cooking, but I don't want to be in the kitchen all day long. And when you feed your children all day long, you're almost in the kitchen all day long. And when you feed your children all day long, you sit down to a good midday meal, they're not interested. Because they had an apple an hour ago. They had a <laughs> biscuit an hour ago. And you've probably worked out when children say they're bored, um, I, I mean, when they say they're hungry, they're usually bored. And when they say they're starving, they obviously don't know what starvation is. <laughs> Trouble is the mother heart's pulls to this. Makes life a lot easier when you just feed your children at mealtime. Dr. Michael Mosley, you've probably heard of him. He has a few shows on SBS. He's just written a book called The Fast Diet. And he talks about fasting between meals. And he talks about time-restricted eating. Have you heard of time-restricted eating? It's actually quite popular now. It's eating two meals in about a six-hour period in a 24-hour day. So that's what we suggest and we do at our health retreat. Main meal at breakfast, another main meal at lunch. And if you have something at night, because maybe you're working hard and you weren't able to get a decent lunch, just have something light at night because you're just about to go to bed. So soup, bowl of soup's good, smoothie or a herb tea, something very light. Now, there's something else that's released 
in the parietal glands down here because remember two thirds of those glands are releasing mucus, it's the intrinsic factor. So what's the intrinsic factor? Let me give you the B12 story because B12 is a, is a bacteria and it's not often understood. So let me use my fingers. This is B12 and this is R protein. And in food, R protein and B12 are connected. And when R protein and B12 get into the stomach, the hydrochloric acid releases them. So now B12 is released from the R protein. And in the stomach, the intrinsic factor is released. So here's intrinsic factor. Now B12 and intrinsic factor float together all the way through the small intestine and getting to the end of the small intestine, intrinsic factor and B12 connect. And when they are connected, then they get absorbed into the body at the la last part of the small intestine, it's called the ileum. And then when it gets into the circulation of the blood, it's taken to the liver and it gets caught up in the enterohepatic circulation, which is a circulating effect. Do you know a lot of the B12 you eat is just recycled? So much so that someone can have no B12 in their diet for 30 years before they show a deficiency. So most people with B12 deficiency, it's because they don't have enough hydrochloric acid or they're not making the intrinsic factor. You see, meat eaters and non-meat -meat eaters alike can suffer from B12 deficiency. And Dr. Neil Nedley, you might have heard of him, famous American doctor, he's written a book called Proof Positive. And he shows in there the research that is proving that B12 can be found in rainwater, B12 can be found on homegrown vegetables, on apples picked off trees, B12 can be found in organically grown root vegetables. So they're the facts that I'm giving you on B12. So let's move on. Coming out of the stomach, here's a little valve down here. It's called the pyloric sphincter. And the pyloric sphincter has sensors. So the pyloric sphincter will only open when it knows the food's broken down to a certain state. And when it gets the messages, the food's broken down to a certain stage, it opens. Let's say this is breakfast, and little by little it comes in. But let's say mid-morning someone has a biscuit, and a cup of tea, or a sandwich and a cup of tea, how many Aussies do that? Or maybe they're really healthy and it's an apple and a handful of nuts. Whatever it is, pyloric sphincter quickly shuts. Oops, something's just come in, it's not broken down. And that will stay shut until this newcomer gets broken down to the right state and ah, and then it can open again. And about an hour later, what happens? Lunch. Lunch comes in. Quick, shut the gate. Something's just come in and it's not broken down properly. Do you know what the research is showing? Breakfast, some remnant of breakfast can be still in the stomach at the end of the day when people are eating all day long. We've got one stomach. Cows can eat all day long because they've got about four or five stomachs. Humans have one stomach. So now what's happening when we get into the duodenum? A lot of things are happening in the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. So this is the duodenum here. And notice you've got the liver and the gallbladder connects with the neck of the pancreas, his pancreas, and there are enzymes coming from the gallbladder, basically from the liver, and the pancreas. So let's have a look at what they're doing. So the next organ is the duodenum. It's not really the organ, but it's actually where these other organs drop into. So let's begin by looking at the liver, which as you can see, releases into the duodenum via the bile duct. Now when you get to the duodenum, now we're in an alkaline environment. We're back to alkaline now. Remember the only acid is stomach. So what's the liver releasing? The, re the liver releases bile and bile breaks down your 
unsaturated fat. Whereas the saturated fat, remember where its breakdown begins? In the mouth. So what bile does, it breaks down your unsaturated fat into tiny little particles. Pancreas. As you can see by my illustration here, the pancreas is also releasing enzymes into the duodenum. So what does the pancreas release? It releases pancreatic lipase. And pancreatic lipase further breaks down your unsaturated fats. So the bile breaks it down to small particles and the pancreatic lipase further breaks it down. Then it can be absorbed into the blood, which we'll look at in a minute. Also, the pancreas releases pancreatic amylase. Now, do you remember what tylen is? It's a salivary amylase. That tylen is a salivary amylase and it starts starts the starch digestion, whereas the pancreatic amylase, it finalizes starch breakdown. Remember, starch breakdown begins in the mouth, put on hold in the acid stomach, now comes into the duodenum, and the pancreatic amylase finalizes starch digestion. The pancreas also releases trypsin. And trypsin is an enzyme that finalizes protein digestion. Remember where protein digestion began? Under pepsin in the stomach. But also, the pancreas releases chymotrypsin. And chymotrypsin is another enzyme that breaks down protein. I've got some good news, it doesn't get much more difficult than this. We're nearly there. Students, what is the main organ of digestion? Pancreas. Can you see that? It's the pancreas. The only food that's broken down in the stomach is protein. Most of our digestion is happening here. And that is why when someone has pancreatic cancer, they usually die from malnutrition because they cannot finalize digestion of all their main nutrients. And if that can't be finalized, it can't get out of the gut and into the blood. So the person can die from malnutrition. Proteolytic enzymes. Proteo Proteolytic enzymes are enzymes that break down protein. So a proteolytic enzyme is pepsin. A proteolytic enzyme is trypsin. And chymotrypsin. In Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. Did you know that there are foods that are proteolytic enzymes? So from the pineapple, the core of the pineapple an extract of bromelain can be taken out. It's a proteolytic enzyme. And from the papaya or the pawpaw, papain can be extracted. And it is a proteolytic enzyme. So if someone has pancreatic problems, they should go on, and you can buy them from the health food shop. They're often called digestive enzymes. And they contain bromelain and papain which are proteolytic enzymes, which can help in the final breakdown of the protein. Before we move on further, what if someone has low hydrochloric acid? How can they boost it? They can boost it by eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper, by not drinking water with their meals. But if they have the juice of a lemon in a little bit of hot water just before the meal, that can get the acid up. And a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little bit of water just before the meal, that'll wake anything up. And did you know that cayenne pepper can heal a stomach ulcer? 
black peppercant, chili peppercant, only cayenne pepper can. Because cayenne comes from the capsicum family, chili from the chili family. Well, students, we're, we're just arriving now at the grand finale of digestion. Do you remember what I said? Anything that goes into your gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down and taken into the blood. Lining the small intestine are villi, and the villi basically look like this. And up the middle of the villi, is a lacteal, that's part of your lymphatic system. And then all through the villi is your blood capillary network. Now covering that villi, and we looked at this on Tuesday night, is a thick turf wall, and it's made up of lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. Makes a thick turf wall. And that thick turf wall plays a very important role in the final act of digestion. Did you know that when a baby's in utero, there's no, there's no gut flora? Their gut is what's called sterile. And when the baby's born, it's literally showered with the mother's microorganisms. And colostrum, that thick, creamy substance that's in the milk in the first few days, it's rich in the gut flora. So what happens when a baby's born and when it has that colostrum? Did you know that a farmer, if the mother dies in cow birth, in cow birth, is that what you call it? If the cow dies in childbirth, what the farmer does, and a farmer told me this, they squeeze that udder and get it into that little calf's mouth. It is so important that that baby calf get that colostrum. In fact, he said, if we can't do that, we may as well kill the calf. It will never, ever be strong. Let's take that to human standards. How important is that? You see, the role that it now plays, this gut flora, it's responsible for the final breakdown of our food. It's, res it's responsible for the absorption of the nutrients out of the gut and into the blood. It's responsible for protecting the blood against any harmful path pathogens that might be in the gut. It's responsible for the nourishment of the little cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. How important is that gut flora? So what would break it down? Antibiotics break it down. All your statin drugs break it down. Contraceptive pill breaks it down. Cortisones, prednisones break it down. Ibuprofen, regular use breaks it down. Now, when you've got gaps in your gut flora, you've now compromised the final breakdown of your food. You have now compromised the absorption of your nutrients through to your blood. You've lost your border protection. And your cells that line the gut have now lost their nourishment. How important is that gut flora? Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut, and he didn't know the fine details of what I've shown you tonight. So what happens if you've lost <laughs> your gut flora? It can return. How do you return it? And how do you know? In fact, some of the symptoms are diarrhea, some of the symptoms are constipation. It's called irritable bowel. And that's the connection with chronic fatigue syndrome. The person's not getting the nutrients out of their gut and into their blood, so no wonder they've got no energy. You see, God made it so that we've got strong acid in there to wipe out any harmful pathogens. But oh dear, the person's drinking with their meals. Oh dear, the person's eating all day long. They're stressed out with their meals. So hydrochloric acid's low, so the microbes are getting through. Further down, it's all right. 
It's all right, we've got another system further down to protect. It's the gut flora. Oh no, <laughs> they've lost their gut flora. Can you see the two processes to protect the blood have both gone down? And so harmful pathogens can get into that blood. So how do we heal from irritable bowel syndrome? Number one, stop. Stop the foods that irritate the lining of the gut. What are the foods that do that? Caffeine. Refined sugar. The hybridized wheat. We touched on the hybridized wheat last night and I'm gonna explore it a bit more tomorrow in the acid alkaline lecture. Dairy. I acknowledge that Lou LaBelle in the paddock eating organic grass who gets milked and made a proper cultured yogurt out of it, that can be healing to the gut. But there aren't many Lou LaBelles in the paddock. <laughs> If you were to feed the milk in the supermarket to a newborn calf, the calf would die. So sorry, you, you can't even compare to what's in there. You're best keeping away from it. People say, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned, I eat food. Milk is for babies. Hmm? We're the only creature that drinks milk past babyhood. Number one, stop all the things that can irritate that lining. Number two, take a probiotic. What's a probiotic? A lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium supplement. Do you know they are the two uh, permanent bacteria that live in your gut? All the others come from those two. Number three, do you remember Psalm 103 verse 14? God made herbs for the service of man. There are two herbs that coat, soothe and heal the lining of the gut and they're both a bit slimy because the lining of the gut is sliming. I think we all know aloe vera. And aloe vera has a growth stimulant. It stimulates rapid healing in the lining of the gut. The other herb, when you put water with it, it just goes a bit slippery. It's called slippery elm. And slippery elm coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut. Is it that simple? It is. Let me give you a story of a lady that came to this lecture in New Zealand when I was there about 18 months ago. She said, I'm 70. I've had irritable bowel syndrome for 30 years. She's been on cortisones, anti-inflammatories. She said, the things that you have told me tonight, no one has ever told me. She said, no one ever told me that these foods were irritating my gut. She was very excited. That was Tuesday night. She went home, she immediately implemented everything she'd heard. She had coconut cream on her breakfast instead of cow's milk. She had a bit of honey on her breakfast instead of sugar. She stopped the wheat and bought some spelt sourdough bread. I think she had some millet for breakfast instead of her oat. Some can handle oats, some cannot. She started to have a dandelion instead of her coffee. She immediately implemented. She's 70, 30 years she's been struggling with this. Thursday night, what's that? Two days, two nights. Thursday night she came up to me and she said, I've stopped bleeding from the colon. She said, I have no more pain. She said, instead of going six times a day, she said, today I went three times. Wow, two days. Is she healed? No, but she's on the road. You're the doctor. What has her body just told her? Yes, yeah. Those cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, they, they remit every three to five days. So the gut can respond very quickly. Where's my little two letter word, if you give it the right conditions. I have seen that happen again and again. How often did she take slippery elm? She was taking it before every meal and before she went to sleep at night. So it coated, soothed and healed the way down. If someone's going to the toilet 10 times a day, they can take slippery elm every half hour. You see, you play with it, you play with it. 
as the healing happens, you can ease back on it. Most of your food is absorbed by the halfway down your small intestine. And then we come down to the ileocecal valve and that ileocecal valve here stops anything going back that way. Everything coming out of your small intestine into your large intestine is a little liquid. So one of the main functions of the large intestine is to take water out so stools are formed so you can pass with ease. So what happens if you've got the other problem, which means you go once a week or twice a week? Dr. Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. So if you eat 10 times a day, how many times should you go? Mm. So what can we do to make sure we are going regularly? Drink adequate water. If you're dehydrated, more water gets taken than, out than should be taken out. Eat plant foods. Plant foods sweep the colon. And by the way, is the appendix a mistake? Does God make mistakes? No. <laughs> well, what's the role of the appendix? It has two main roles. It's called the colon's oil can. It lubricates the contents to get it through easily, and it also releases antibacterial fluids so that if what's coming out of here is toxic, how would it be toxic if a person's eating a high meat diet which putrefies and a lot of sugar and alcohol, what's coming out of here is pretty nasty. And so the appendix has to quickly release that antibacterial fluid to sort of calm it down so that it can get it out of your body without poisoning you. Whew. So make sure you eat a lot of plant foods to get that sweeping action through. Right down near the end, you see there's a little loop and there's a muscle there that's holding that little last part loop up. And we're very glad of that muscle. It's called puborectalis. And that muscle prevents us having accidents. But let me show you something about the puborectalis. Here is the throne, and here is the person sitting on the throne. When a person sits on the throne, puborectalis remains taunt. Now, things can still get through, but if a person sits on the throne, and in the front of the throne, they put a little stool, or they might buy a squatty potty from Bed Bath and Beyond, and they're mimicking the squatting position, the knees are up in the air. And when the knees are up in the air, mimicking the squatting position, then puborectalis relaxes. And when puborectalis relaxes, then the colon totally opens and the contents can be released with great ease. Do you know, in many countries today, squatting still happens. I was in Punjab, India, at the beginning of the year. And as I traveled down to New Delhi, I stayed in an apartment there before I flew out the next day. It was a beautiful apartment, all lined with marble. I went into my bathroom, all marble, and oh, there's a hole in the ground. <laughs> that was the toilet. In many countries, people still squat. And it has found to be, scientifically and medically, they prove it today, the best way to do the daily evacuation. If someone's not going and they're sitting and they decide to put some strain there, it puts a lot of strain on the anus and hemorrhoids can come out. And hemorrhoids are not very nice. So squatting can heal hemorrhoids, squatting can prevent hemorrhoids because squatting takes all the pressure off the anus. Probably two years ago, squatty potties were about $50. Well, they're becoming quite popular. And so I think you can get them for about even $20 now. But it's worthwhile investing on that. But it's also a good idea to practice this. Got that? Every day, <laughs> we should squat. 
And in many countries, that's a very natural position. It became a very natural position for me when I, I read a book called Active Birth by Janet Belaskis. And I practiced squatting all through my pregnancy. And when my baby was born, the whole baby flew out of me with one push, with the bag intact there to catch the baby. Wow, squatting does wonderful things. <laughs> because squatting opens that whole pelvic area. So it's very important to practice squatting. If you see, when, when you do squat, when you're coming up, all the pressure's put on your quads, your thighs. So if you can't do that, just go up and down like this every time you're washing the dishes or doing things and get, get those muscles strong again. Very important to strengthen that pelvic girdle so that we keep the muscles strong. And tomorrow night, I'm gonna to be talking about exercise. And I'm gonna be show you how muscle knows no age. Whether you're nine or 90, your muscles can be strong. And what's really sad that many people today getting into their, believe it or not, 50s, 60s, 70s, are having prolapses, purely because their muscles aren't strong enough. But if you get into the habit of squatting, to go to the bathroom every day with that little stool in front and even getting into the habit of squatting in your daily exercise, you can strengthen that pelvic girdle so these things do not happen. So thank you for your attention as we went on the wonderful journey through our gastrointestinal tract to see what happens to the food we eat. I'm gonna give everyone a break now. Mm -hmm.